And first of all, I would like to thank uh, my friend, uh, Professor Marlene, Marlene Boulart, and all the organizers of this meeting for having invited me to uh, this, uh, this fantastic meeting. Um, as Christian said, uh, I'm the director of the Medical Research Council unit in the Gambia, which this year uh, celebrates 70, 70 years of activity. Um, so, as uh, Christian said also, this is a quite prestigious unit with uh, 1,200 staff, and we do quite a lot of work in different areas, including malaria. Uh, the other things about the Gambia is that this is the smallest uh, African country on mainland, but uh, it's a country that gave a lesson to other countries because it shook away the dictator of 22 years, Yaya Jamme, just last January. Anyway, let's go to malaria elimination. What are the available tools and new challenges? Uh, I think this one, I was in the session uh, where Christian was, who also showed this uh, slide. And this appeared uh, in, uh, uh, in 2015 in Nature, and it just showed the fantastic progress that we have witnessed these last 10 or 20, 15 years uh, in terms of mala uh, malaria control. If you look here at the uh, picture of uh, uh, Africa, uh, malaria prevalence, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2000, and when you look at the colors where red means the highest prevalence, and you look at, the, at this picture here of 2015 where most of the, uh, of the colors have shifted to blue, it means that has, there's been a huge progress in terms of malaria control. And this bottom uh, figure shows that the darker green are the places where the progress has been more uh, important. So you see that even in countries like uh, DRC, there has been a huge progress. So, uh, fantastic news, but malaria is still there. Uh, transmission is still ongoing. Looking at the estimate from the um, uh, malaria war report of last year, actually the next, the next report, the, the report for 2017 is going to be launched at the end of November. Uh, if you look at the malaria cases from 2000, 2015, for, uh, 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 you see that for, uh, Pifalciparum, there's been a huge decrease of 14%. Uh, we still have uh, about 200, uh, a bit more than 200 million cases. Um, and for Vivax, uh, there's been an even, uh, even bigger uh, decrease. And, and looking at each, because Africa is the place where Pifalciparum is more prevalent, if we look at the, uh, at the single uh, in, uh, countries and we look at the trend of cases, we see that generally speaking, there is a trend, a decreasing trend, except maybe for a few countries like, for example, Gabon, Mali, and Rwanda. But everywhere else, we, we, we observe a decrease in the number of cases reported. Similarly, for, for mortality or malaria mortality, which is extremely difficult to define, because uh, uh, it's very difficult to attribute to malaria certain deaths, and sometimes malaria is an indirect cause of death for other causes. Uh, if we, uh, we look at the, at the estimated death here from 2000 to 2015, uh, we had a decrease a bit of 22% from 2000 to 2015, uh, with about a bit less probably the half a million death. Uh, and similarly, there is a huge decrease in the uh, deaths due to Vivax, although these, the deaths due to Vivax are much less compared to the deaths due to Plasmodium falciparum. And um, knowing that the, the mortality is much higher in children under five, particularly in African children, and you look at the estimate uh, deaths in the under five, you see that there's even a, a significant decrease there as well, mi minus 29%. And again, here the trend seems to go down in every single country, African country. So this is due to uh, uh, substantial commitment, financial commitment from different donors. Uh, and if you look here at the, um, uh, at the amount of, of billion US dollars that have been uh, uh, committed to the fight against malaria, it has increased sharply from 2005 to 2009, and afterwards have reached 
a plateau, and here you have the different component, different donors that are uh, giving, uh, donating um, uh, resources for, for, for malaria control. And uh, when uh, looking at the type of, of financing, what, what, what these donors finance, the government, of course, finance primarily the health system, while the Global Fund and the President M Malaria Initiative funds essentially or mostly uh, commodities like bed nets, like treatment, uh, and very little health system. Uh, this is again taken from the uh, Malaria Award uh, report 2016, and it's quite interesting because it shows the different donors on one side, on the left side, uh, you see here, uh, here are the governments of endemic country uh, and how the amount of, of, of funding that goes to, uh, to endemic country. Uh, and obviously US, uh, USA, UK are the, among the biggest donors after the, the, the governments in endemic country. And then you have other contributions like France, Germany, Japan, Canada, and here it is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, EU, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of this funding goes to the Global Fund, um, uh, and the Global Fund uh, is extremely important for malaria control because it, 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 man, it provides the, the funding to maintain the uh, gain we, we are uh, having today. So it's mainly uh, funding for uh, buying bed nets, buying treatment, buying diagnostic tests. So the other question here is what is going to happen to this funding, USA, uh, once uh, President Trump decide to revise this, but we don't know really. Okay, so let's talk about malaria elimination. This is not a, a new idea. Uh, there was a global malaria eradication program that was launched in the 50s um, that was based, this was the sort of uh, roadmap um, of, of the global eradication program. And it's a quite simplistic approach because, uh, oops, it's quite a simplistic approach because basically they wanted to interrupt transmission with uh, vector control activity, mainly DDT. Um, and then, um, so you have the, here is the, the res human reservoir, uh, uh, the parasite reservoir, interrupt transmission with DDT. The parasite reservoir would be eliminated. And once uh, this would be eliminated, then we could have uh, stopped. Uh, um, uh, spring activity, and then even if the vector would have been there, he wouldn't have transmitted the, uh, the, the, the disease or the infection. I mean, this is a quite simplistic approach, and now we realize that uh, interrupting transmission, eliminating malaria, or eradicating malaria needs a more articulate response, and also a response that is uh, adapted to the local circumstances. So, uh, the failure of the eradication program uh, caused a sort of uh, uh, depression, I would say, across the world in terms of how are we, are we are going to control malaria, how we are going to reduce the burden. And for quite a long time, um, the E word, as you say, the E word, so the elimination and eradication was basically forbidden. forbidden. So, no malariologists who talk about eradication, no malariologists who talk about elimination because of the failure of the, of the previous program. But we have here um, uh, a billionaire, American billionaire, uh, who, who funded a Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and decided to help the world in solving some of his most pressing problems, including health problems. And so in 2007, um, Bill and Melinda uh, Gates uh, announced to the world that they want to go for eradication. And everybody was really stunned about this because, and this is, uh, this is reflected by the title into the, of this journal, did they really say eradication? So something, a word that could not be pronounced before. And uh, well, then people say, well, you know, well, maybe we should think about it. Is it possible at all? And uh, just to make some clarity on some concept uh, between uh, the difference between eradication and elimination. Um, so eradication is a permanent reduction to zero of the worldwide incidence of malaria as a result of time-bound deliberate effort. And I think this is very important. 
bound, uh, time bound, deliberate effort. So that means that you go in, you try to stop transmission, transmission has, inter uh, has stopped everywhere in the world, then you stop your effort and you don't need, you don't fear any reintroduction. Uh, so it's basically wiping out malaria across the world. Elimination is very different. It's reduction to zero of the incidence of malaria in the defined geographical area as a result of deliberate efforts. So it means that you can eliminate malaria in a given country or in, even in a region in a country, but you have neighbor region where there is still uh, malaria transmission, so malaria can be reintroduced. So it means that you need to continue to control for malaria. You need to con have me measure that prevent the reestablishment of, of the transmission. And for the time being, we are talking nowadays about elimination. And some countries have been uh, able to eliminate malaria. A few countries have been able to eliminate malaria. But other countries are on the path of eliminating malaria, but not quite there. So uh, this announcement of uh, Bill and Melinda Gates uh, was followed by discussion. And eventually, the WHO uh, tried to, uh, in a way, I would say, but not in a negative way, jump into the wagon, and, and they managed to, into, uh, a few months later, to uh, uh, really uh, formulate a, a global malaria action plan for a malaria-free world. This was followed, and very recently, by a framework for malaria elimination by the Global Malaria Program, in which, in actual fact, before we are distinguishing between uh, uh, countries uh, applying malaria control measure, countries going for elimination. Nowadays, all countries should work towards the goal of malaria elimination, regardless of the intensity of transmission. So in, in actual fact, the control of malaria, the decrease of a public health burden of malaria is, is just one stage the, on the path of eliminating and then eradicating malaria. So, and uh, this framework is it's based on four pillars and then two uh, sort of uh, basements. Um, one pillar is uh, ensure universal access to malaria prevention diagnosis. This is absolutely essential. Everybody should have access to um, standard, standard diagnostic, uh, diagnostic and, and treatment. Everybody should have access to standard prevention measures, which are insecticide bed nets, uh, which are intermittent preventive treatment for pregnant women, seasonal malaria chemo prevention for children under five, and so on and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> the pillar two, we have accelerated effort towards elimination and attainment of malaria-free status. And this is something in which, for which we researchers, scientists, we are particularly uh, interested because we can contribute a good deal into this. And then third, transform malaria surveillance into a core intervention. And, of, and at the basis of it, you have research and then the strengthening the, the enabling environment. So I have an environment that allows you to apply and implement all the intervention that you want to implement. <clears throat> so uh, this is a very, very uh, ambition goal. So you have that by 2020 to reduce uh, by at least 40%. And for the level we had in 2015, which is really already, they're already uh, very low, uh, or relatively low, uh, at l reduce further malaria mortality by at least 40%. Uh, by 2025, to reduce it at least uh, 75%, and then in 2030, by at least 20%. The same apply for morbidity, the malaria case incidence compared to 2015, and then uh, have at least 10 countries, and usually, at, you know, up to now, the countries that have recently announced to, to have eliminated malaria, I think the last one was Sri Lanka last year. Uh, are the countries where the transmission was already very low and were at the edge of the transmission uh, area. So to have had other, at least 10 countries by 2020 who declare, that declare to have eliminated malaria, uh, at least 20 countries in 2025, and at least 35 countries in 2030. And of course, uh, this uh, uh, elimination, which is a process where in which uh, in which the country are certificated that they are free of malaria um, should uh, be uh, coupled with uh, measures that, uh, that prevent the reestablishment of malaria. Because in actual fact, here you have elimination, so you have other countries where malaria transmission is ongoing. So uh, 
Well, I mentioned these, uh, the, the global strategy for malaria, so we have different four components. The component A, which is, again, universal access, uh, and component B, so increase the surveillance to be able to detect where malaria transmission occurs, uh, characterize and monitor all cases to, to know where they're coming from. Um, and then uh, component C, where, again, this is where we are most uh, interested in accelerated transmission reduction, so deployment of additional timely efficient intervention to reduce transmission efficiency. So you have mass drug administration, for example, vaccine, but other approaches that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, and then the component D that investigate and clearing individual cases, managing foci and, fo and, fo and following them up. So in this case, when you have malaria elimination, finding a few uh, close to, I mean, when you are close to uh, malaria elimination, find the few remaining infection and foci and, and then really uh, wipe them out. This is, uh, these four components are uh, expressed graphically in this slide. Um, and then again, as I said before, you have the continuum of transmission from high to low, to low, moderate low, to very low, to zero, and then monitoring zero, so to prevent uh, reintroduction. And obviously, uh, the component A and component B are uh, relevant for the, any, any intensity of transmission, but component C and component D particularly are particularly re relevant when the transmission is low to very low or you are very close to zero. So everything is fine, but you know, of course, uh, uh, it's, 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 it's not easy, first of all. But you know, on top of that, we have to think that the vector and the parasite are biological system. They are very plastic, and they can adapt to uh, uh, changing condition. And one of the major threats for these plants are the emergence of Artemisin resistant in Southeast Asia, particularly at, at the Cam Thai Cambodian border. Uh, here you see the Artemisin resistance was first uh, characterized by a, a, a delay in clear, clearance of parasitemia of, of infection um, when uh, patients were treated with artemisinin-based combination. And uh, this uh, delay in clearance has been uh, associated with the occurrence of a particular mutation in the K13 uh, gene of the parasite, plasmodium falciparum, and the red, uh, the red uh, uh, zone, uh, the red area, correspond to the prevalence of this uh, mutation that confers resistance to artemisinin. A and you can see that there are places where actual fat, this, this, this uh, uh, mutation is uh, highly prevalent. Although uh, people have said, well, oh, these people, it is true, they, they show a delay in uh, clearance of paracetamia, but uh, eventually they are cured. This is true, but this delay uh, actually make the, the, the partner drug in the combination more vulnerable. And unfortunately, we have seen in, uh, in Cambodia, here you have the, uh, the success rate, oops, sorry, the success rate of, uh, of artesanate mefloquine in red, the artemisinin piperacone in, in black, and here you have 100% efficacy, right? Uh, 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 and you can see that the artemisinin piperacone here, for example, here, uh, uh, as an efficacy that is less than optimal. That means that also the piperaquine component in the combination is failing. And this uh, resistance to be of piperaquine has been associated uh, uh, to a particular um, gene in the, in the parasite that make it, the copy number is increased, uh, the, the, of this gene is increased, and, and it makes the, the parasite more resistant to the treatment. So these are uh, really the threat for this sort of roadmap that uh, will bring, bring us to malaria elimination. The other, the other threat, which I didn't put it here, is insecticide resistance, of course, which may be, is, uh, may, may be also problematic. So the other point I want to make is that malaria elimination, so the effort for malaria elimination needs to be uh, continued even when uh, the burden of malaria is going to be extremely low, and this is what we observed in Sri Lanka many years ago, when uh, following the, uh, the decrease, substantial decrease of malaria cases, the uh, 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 IRS, which is indoor residual, indoor residual spraying, was stopped. You can see a quick 
increase on malaria cases. And similarly, in Zanzibar, we observed the same problem. The program was malaria program, uh, malaria control program was altered, and then again we have uh, increase of parasite prevalence from less than five percent to uh, fifty percent. So it means that when you engage in malaria elimination, you cannot, uh, in a sense, relax before you have um, basically eradicated the, or, the, or eliminated to very, very low uh, level the risk of reintroduction of, of, of malaria infection. So what's the problem for, I mean, one of the main problems for, for malaria elimination is the human reservoir. Um, uh, it is still unclear what is the role of, of this human reservoir in maintaining the transmission, but I believe that, personally I believe that is very important. The other point is that uh, in high transmission setting, if you look at the number of infected individuals, uh, most of the, a uh, few of them are going to be, in high transmission setting, are going to be symptomatic. Quite a lot of them are going to be microscopically uh, uh, diagnosable, uh, identifiable, uh, and then a few are going to be submicroscopic. Uh, that means that are below the threshold of microscopy detection. In low transmission setting, although the prevalence may be lower than in high transmission setting, the large majority of infection are submicroscopic. So they can be detected by a microscopy, but they, should, uh, they, they can be detected only by uh, molecular methods detecting the, the, um, the DNA or the RNA of, of, of the parasite. And we know that most of these infections got, have got gametocytes, and the gametocytes are the form of the parasite that is transmitted to mosquito, and, um, and the transmission, the onward transmission from human to mosquito depends on, uh, on the parasite uh, density, the gametocyte density in this case. But you see that is a sort of sigma-shaped curve. Uh, we have quite a uh, uh, prob high probability of mosquito getting infected uh, when uh, you pass the threshold under gametocytes per microliter, but even be below 100 uh, gametocytes per microliter, the, uh, although the risk of infecting mosquitoes is low, it's still there. And we have to think that this, uh, the infected uh, people, uh, people with, inf uh, with an infection floating in their blood, they are apparently healthy most of the time, uh, but they are, are keeping this infection for weeks or months, and so you have the, the, the even if the, the, the probability of infecting mosquitoes is low, um, but you have, they may be bitten several times over a period of, 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 of five or six months, and then may, may infect actually the vector, and then the vector may continue transmission. So uh, I was, uh, so the asymptomatic malaria infection, which apparently now they're going to be called low density infection, defined as infection of, uh, uh, a density of, of less than 100 parasites per microliter. Um, so they are uh, about half of the infection are undetected by microscopy, as I was saying, and the difference greatest in low transmission setting, and then they can persist for a long period of time. And and the uh, gametocytes are positively associated with no symptom, symptoms and low asexual parasite density. In other words, uh, if an infection is uh, asymptomatic, it's more likely to have also gametocyte and the mosquitoes are infected with uh, uh, gametocyte density as low as five gametocytes per microliter. And also we have observed transmission, onward transmission, uh, from children to mosquito with uh, children with, uh, with no gametocytemia undetectable, I mean, uh, gametocyte, gametocyte undetectable by, by molecular methods. So having, having said that, having given this, this introduction, uh, I just want to uh, show you what we are, what, are, what is your, our research program in the Gambia in terms of uh, th research for malaria elimination. And the Gambia is a fantastic place to do this research because it's a, it's a country where that has, has, has done a lot of progress, uh, has decreased substantially the burden of malaria, and also is a country where the burden of malaria is extremely heterogeneous. So you have prevalence as low as less than 1%, for example, here, and then while in the West, and then you have prevalences, this is a survey that was done in November 2012, uh, 
prevalence as, as almost as 50% in the eastern part of the Gambia. So we wanted to understand uh, the uh, dynamics of transmission, what makes, what maintains this transmission, and uh, who are the people infected, how they infect mosquitoes, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to present a few, a few data, a uh, few results about this. So the first of all, we, d we uh, um, identified six pairs of villages across the Gambia that you see here. Um, so to have a, a sort of breadth of or the difference in terms of, uh, of infection, a transmission intensity and infection across the country. And um, so this started in 2013 and end in the 2015. We're still analyzing the data, but it consisted in monthly bleeds. So uh, taking a blood sample from all uh, uh, inhabitants of the village every month during the transmission season. Uh, so from June to December, and once during the dry season in April, where there's virtually no transmission, and also passive case detection. Uh, uh, and so the following years, 2014 and 2015, we uh, actually did uh, a mass drug administration with uh, Didotomizumib Paraquin, only one round in June, to see how the, the parasite reservoir would sort of behave uh, f uh, in front of, of this intervention and to see also who got reinfected first after the, the, the intervention. Um, and then, yes, and then similarly we had monthly bleeds and passive case detection uh, at a facility. So this is, these are the result of the 2013 transmission season. I'm going to, so these are the, the months, these are the prevalence here and there. Um, here you have the, in the boxes you have the prevalence by month and, and also the, the, the lighter box corresponds to sub-patent infection, so not detected by microscopy but detected by molecular methods. You see that there is clearly a, 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 um, two, there are clearly two strata in the Gambia, uh, whereas you have uh, here in the North Bank and also here in the West, you have the prevalence wobbling around during the transmission season and uh, while in the east, particularly here in the North Bank, you have a classic peak of malaria which goes up to, uh, I can't read it, but I think it's about 35, 30, almost 40 percent prevalence uh, during the month of uh, November. Uh, and you have here also, these are the, per the percentage of infection with gametocytes. I mean here it's bit varies quite a lot because the, the, the prevalence is, is pretty low, but uh, you can see that the prevalence of gametocytes actually raise during the transmission season and, and, and also the incidence of infection, not of, of, of clinical cases, uh, uh, raise steadily during, during the transmission season and then, then they just drops um, in December, January. But still, in, uh, in, in April, so there's virtually no transmission during this period, you still have quite a lot of people, or relatively a lot of people, uh, with a malaria infection. And so you have here, for example, something like 10%, uh, here 5%, uh, uh, here is less than 5%, less than 5%. The other thing that is very interesting is that uh, at the beginning of the transmission season, you have uh, something like 5% prevalence of infection just before the transmission start, except here in, in, this, in this part of the country, but then, even like that, you, you see that the, the pattern is, is very different from one region to the other. And we would like to understand why, uh, why this happens. One interesting thing is also that uh, the risk of infection, the, the risk of disease according to infectious status of the people living around you, um, this is actually the risk of pr probability of remaining disease free if you have somebody in your uh, house who is infected at the beginning of the transmission season. And you see that here, for example, if you don't have any infected individual during the transmission season, the risk of, 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 of um, remaining disease free doesn't decrease very much. While if you have uh, uh, somebody infected in your house at the beginning of the transmission season, and I'm saying infected and not symptomatic, completely healthy, uh, then you see that you are very likely to 
experience a malaria attack. So this shows also that the transmission is very clustered and the ideally we should try to identify this cluster and possibly uh, eliminate these pockets of, of transmission um, if possible. So we also try to see how the infection uh, between uh, villages and months are related. So we did a, 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 an analysis according to more than 50 SNPs uh, of the genome of the parasite. And so each line corresponds to two infections related to each other. Uh, so these are the villages here, and these are the the, the months, you see that is a complete mess, <laughs> a complete mess. Well, so we try to, to actually superimpose these two uh, pies together and try to have a sense of what happens in terms of flow of infection from one part of the country to the other. And this is what we get. So if you think about the Gambia like a, a, a cake and you do a slice for each month, um, so these you have here, uh, uh, July, August, September, October, November, December, and the blue line are the flow from west to east. In other words, they are parasite, inf I mean, infection that uh, are similar according to our analysis and may be related. And then you have, so this, the blue is west to east and the green is, is uh, east to west. Um, actually, we had the uh, previous results were made more sense because a lot of infection seems to come from the eastern part. Here it doesn't seem to be the case, but still during the uh, peak transmission season you have quite a lot of flow uh, from east uh, to west. In any case, it's quite complicated. We are just at the beginning of trying to understand what's going on, but, but as you see, uh, it's, 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 there is a lot of flow which is important to know because, uh, you know, if, if you eliminate malaria in a, in a place, you are likely to have introduction uh, of, of infection from an uh, adjacent place if, if uh, uh, you know, if a neighbor country or neighbor region, uh, there is still transmission. So this is uh, um, just to show uh, briefly uh, the, uh, what happened with the MDA, with the one dose of uh, uh, one treatment of desertization and piperaquine. And as you see uh, here, you have some, a decrease in the prevalence uh, of, of, of infection after two, two months, but then infection just restart again afterwards. So I think for MDA, probably the best option would be to have uh, at least three rounds, and probably the best option would be to have three rounds uh, during the dry season when there is no transmission in order to clear the reservoir infection before the transmission gets started. Okay, so um, this is a sort of descriptive uh, epidemiology we, we, we are doing. I don't know what, uh, what I'm doing with time. Two to five minutes. Oh, okay. Um, so just briefly, is about uh, a study we did uh, about Prima Queen, uh, uh, two clear gametocytes um, in asymptomatic carriers. Um, and, and so we, we, we tested different doses of primaquin because the effect, uh, the hemolytic effect related to the GCXPD status is dose dependent. And so we, we, we actually, uh, yes, so the, the, the recommendation of WHO are to use a single dose primaquin 0.25 milligram base per kilogram in uncomplicated falciparum malaria in a context of pre-elimination or elimination program. However, uh, it were, I mean, at the time we started the study, we didn't know that if primaquin would have an impact on gametocyte uh, in asymptomatic carriers. And so we did this trial where we uh, identified asymptomatic carriers, randomized them to four groups. Uh, one treated with detoxamacin piperaquin uh, alone, uh, and the other three groups having different doses of primaquin, 0.20 milligram per kilo, 0.40 milligram per kilo and 0.75 milligram per kilo. By the way, at the time we started the trial, this was the recommended dose by WHO. And here is the percentage of gametocyte carriage. The, um, the prima queen treatment was done at day two here. Um, and here you see the, the artemisinin piperaquine alone, uh, the first box or column, uh, and then the other 
three columns following are the different doses of primaquine. You can see that by day 7, 10, and 14 after treatment, there is a clear impact of, of primaquine on, uh, yes, on malaria. Similarly, for the gametocyte carriage, the uh, risk of gametocyte carriage, it decreased substantially uh, with the different doses of primaquine. So the other things we are doing, this is also in collaboration with a uh, group of uh, anthropology, medical anthropology group at, at the institute here, uh, is what is called reactive household based self-administered treatment against the residual malaria transmission, uh, uh, abbreviated as ROST. And I'm going to, it's a cluster randomized trial that try to uh, answer several research questions. And one is if treating household members of clinical malaria cases would reduce the residual parasite carriage, and then if malaria patient and their uh, parents or their fa the family can administer the treatment to the household member or the com compound member, if it's socially acceptable and sustainable, and uh, uh, what's the impact in the, on the health system and the cost and cost effectiveness. And it's a large trial with 37 village where the prevalence of infection is 5%, and the intervention in Didotis and Piperaquine, it's ongoing, um, where basically asymptomatic individual is identified at the health facility, is given treatment, and also given treatment for the people around him, and then the village health worker follow up this, the treatment after three days and see if there is any issue with the treatment. Uh, the, the second, uh, the other things that we are going to start is to look at the administration of ivermectin, Ivermectin is an endotoxidal, so basically, if somebody has, has been treated with ivermectin and a mosquito bites this person, the mosquito dies. Uh, and so we are going want to see what is the effect of ivermectin and the, and the interspecies piperaquine must get drug administration on malaria transmission. Uh, is, 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 a, is a study that has been just funded by the Joint Global Trial Scheme, but this is the mathematical model that shows these are the, the rounds of treatment, uh, three rounds of treatment, and this is the prevalence. According to the mathematical model, if it's right, we should have almost zero prevalence at the end of, of, of the intervention. Uh, yeah. So, in conclusion, um, the universal access to standard control intervention, case management, LLIN, so long-lasting societal net, indoor residual spraying, seasonal malaria can prevention, intermittent preventive treatment in pregnancy is a priority. Uh, it's crucial to involve local population. With the ROST, with the study we are doing with ROST, that's what we are trying to do. Uh, new intervention need to be tested, and if, success, if successful, rapidly integrate into malaria control activities. Uh, we need to continue to have political and financial support, even if the, the malaria burden is very low. And containing emerging drug and synthetic resistance is a priority. Uh, I would like to show uh, the collaborators here, including Kuhn Peters and his group, Chris Drickley at London School of Tropical Medicine, Tim Basma at Nijmegen, Steve Lindsay at Durham University. And uh, I think if there are young scientists here, uh, I would like to encourage them to join us in the fight against malaria. Thank you very much.